the La Crosse Public Library Archives presents Dark La Crosse Stories, a series in collaboration with the La Crosse Tribune. Dark La Crosse is a suite of programs that feature the seedier side of La Crosse history and also include a downtown walking tour, a trolley tour, and an annual stage production with new content each year. At 8.57 p.m. on the night of November 14, 1947, county police were notified of a man lying on the shoulder of Highway 16. Officers were sent immediately. What they discovered was the body of prominent physician and surgeon James McLoon. The 49-year-old doctor had been shot four times. Three of the bullets from a 38 caliber pistol entered the back of his head and the fourth penetrated his shoulder. Authorities quickly ruled out robbery narcotics addiction, and auto theft as possible motives. A couple driving that night reported seeing a man supporting or dragging another man from the back of a car to the highway shoulder. The woman stated she had the impression that the man on the highway was helping a sick person. Our community was shaken to the core. A respected doctor, a Catholic family man with a wife and children, a leading local tennis player, had been gunned down in cold blood while making house calls. His car had been found on Cash Street between 22nd and 23rd Streets. Everything in the vehicle was in order and there was no sign of a struggle. A massive and passionate search for clues and information ensued. Over 200 Lacrosse Boy Scouts volunteered to conduct a widespread search for the murder weapon. The Chamber of Commerce and the Lacrosse County Medical Society each offered a thousand dollar reward for information leading to an arrest and conviction of the assailant. The mayor gave authority to spend whatever city funds are necessary to conduct the search. Then, for two full years, nothing. No arrests had been made. Until on September 29, 1949, a dapper, good-looking 35-year-old car salesman from Minneapolis, Minnesota was taken into custody for the murder of Dr. James McLoon. His name was Arnie Larson. Please don't call me Arnie. I, I don't really care for it. I, I like Arnold always have. I was brought in for questioning nearly six times after the murder. They, they claimed I hid in McLoon's car and forced the good doctor to the outskirts of the city where I shot him. The motive? Revenge. Dr. McLoon was responsible for the death of my two-year-old son, Jimmy. His death certificate states that he died of shock and toxemia following a one-day bowel obstruction after being ill for 20 days with a ruptured appendix. That's what it states officially. But my sweet Jimmy died due to McLoon's gross incompetence. If it wasn't for him, my dear son would still be alive. Now, I threatened the quack, but I didn't kill him. The trial was a circus. They there wasn't even standing room left in the courtroom. My own mother-in-law testified against me. No big surprise there. Even my wife, Nola, excuse me, my ex-wife, Nola, testified that I admitted to killing Mickle Looney. She is my ex-wife now, but at the time of the trial, we were still technically married due to a clerical error in the filing of the divorce papers. There was a lot of questions on whether a wife can testify against her husband, but oh boy, she sure did. She said I was out of the house at the time of the murder. She told the jury I threatened to have her killed if I were sent away. She even told them that I had planned to torture the good doctor. They threw everyone on the witness stand, including several Catholic nuns. Sister Clarella, head pediatric nurse at the hospital, stated seeing several threatening letters from me. The jury deliberated for a little over five hours. The verdict? <laughs> Not guilty. <laughs> innocent, innocent, innocent. Uh, unfortunately, I wasn't as lucky during my next legal battle. A year later, I was charged with destruction of property after my in-laws said I threw a concrete block through the window of their house. I pleaded not guilty to that charge and acted as my own attorney. 
the district attorney even question my sanity. Can you believe that? They, they thought I was nuts. They sent me to a Pond State Hospital for evaluation, but they found me sane. <laughs> Um, I, I called 50 witnesses to the, sense, uh, to the stand, a record, I've been told. It didn't do much good. I was found guilty and then immediately charged with perjury. Arnold Larson was the only suspect to be arrested and tried for the murder of Dr. James McClune. It remains an unsolved murder to this day. With all due respect to the very honorable victim, Dr. James E. McClune, it's only two years later when someone is finally arrested for the murder that this story gets very interesting, drawing national attention for a number of reasons. Beginning with the arrest of Arnold Larson and his extradition from Minnesota in early of October 1949, the story is covered breathlessly in the La Crosse Tribune almost daily for the next three months, and then the trial fallout off and on for the next two years. Prior to his arrest, Larson had been attempting to have set aside a divorce granted to his wife, Nola, in the La Crosse court three months prior. At this time, Nola and their five-year-old daughter were living in La Crosse with her parents. The divorce was granted to Mrs. Larson on charges of desertion. At the time of his arrest for murder, his local lawyer on the divorce dispute, 29-year-old Philip Arneson, said Larson had been in La Crosse quite a few times in recent weeks to discuss his marital problems. Larson's lawyer claimed that the court lacked jurisdiction because the divorce papers were not served directly on Larson. Instead, they had been delivered to the home of his parents in Iowa, an address at which Arnold Larson had not lived for several years. This divorce dispute would play a very large role in the following murder trial. Even though the divorce dispute, which had begun in court before Larson was arrested for the murder of Dr. McClune, was not yet resolved, Mrs. Larson was called to the stand by 29-year-old District Attorney John S. Coleman in a preliminary hearing of the murder trial to testify against Larson. With the question of whether they were technically married or not still up in the air, this action of a wife testifying against her husband in a murder trial was reported to be without precedent under Wisconsin law. With no jury present yet at the preliminary hearing, her testimony was still very damning as it was reported verbatim in the newspaper accounts the next day. Good luck trying to find a jury of 12 citizens who weren't reading along with the huge headlines in this captivating case. Mrs. Larson testified that Larson had confessed to her that he had murdered Dr. McClune. This confession was made just three months prior during a conversation after the divorce proceedings had begun, which, if you recall, was nearly two years after the murder of Dr. McClune. Mrs. Larson claimed to have been threatened herself at the same time when Larson allegedly said if she didn't, quote, be quiet, there would be others who would see that you got the right amount of lead in your head. The legal maneuvers to dispute the divorce and keep his wife from testifying at the trial delayed the Larson murder trial for two weeks. Larson's legal team even began calling for all charges against Larson to be dropped, as they believed the state was relying on Mrs. Larson's testimony as their only evidence of his guilt on the charge of murder. If she couldn't testify, the state would have no case, they claimed. Ultimately, the divorce would be ruled invalid by a circuit court judge, which was seen in the moment as a win for the defense. Arnold Larson's lawyer could object to Mrs. Larson's testifying in the upcoming murder trial as a defendant's wife. However, because the defense had waived the right to object to Mrs. Larson's testimony as his wife at the preliminary hearing, the trial judge ruled they had no grounds to challenge her as a witness during the trial itself. The defense had only officially challenged her as a witness after her explosive testimony regarding his alleged confession was heard at the preliminary hearing. This monumental decision meant Nola Larson testified in open court before the jury, a huge win for the prosecution. Despite this, as you've already heard, the jury determined Arnold Larson was innocent on the charge of murder. With no physical evidence that Larson had killed Dr. McLoone, the prosecution's case had relied too heavily on circumstantial evidence, such as his wife's testimony that he had confessed, testimony of McLoone's staff, including the Catholic nuns mentioned in the story, regarding threatening letters sent by Larson to McLoone before the murder, and testimony by authorities that he never denied the killing when questioned about it. Following the trial, Noah Larson would again file for divorce, this time on the grounds of desertion, non-support, and cruel and inhuman treatment. Surely this time the divorce papers were served on him directly. Despite Larson contesting the divorce again on the grounds that it would limit his custody of their child, Noah Larson was granted the divorce and custody. While there are many other aspects of this story worth exploring, and I welcome anyone to come and read newspaper articles for yourself, one final note was too interesting not to share here. On the final morning of the trial, an attempt to tamper with the jury was foiled by the bailiff. 
Mrs. Edith Martinson, an employee of the La Crosse Hotel where the jury was staying, dropped a note on the floor in front of the jury as they were leaving the hotel for the courthouse. The note declared, I have excellent material which will protect Mr. Larson. While the incident was reported to the court and Martinson duly questioned by the judge, it was determined that no one on the jury read the note nor even saw the incident take place. A charge of contempt of court was later dropped upon the results of an examination that determined that Martinson was mentally ill and had previously spent 10 years in a mental institution. Thanks for listening.